Good evening and welcome to the second of two special sessions of Ask the Ministers, focusing on the government plan. Last night we focused on government finances, healthcare, COVID and putting children first. Tonight it's the economy, heritage and identity, housing and combating income inequality. And finally, the environment. So we have a fresh set of ministers and assistant ministers for you tonight. So please join me in Ask the Ministers. Good evening and welcome to the Government of Jersey studio in St Helier. My name is Chris Rayner, a former broadcaster and journalist and your host for this evening. We're focusing on the Government Plan this week, the document that aims to marry up the Government's policy intentions and its spending plans with the measures it'll use to raise the money and pay for them. It's also an update on how things have been going over not just the last 12 months but also the last four years. Our politicians We'll be thinking ahead, no doubt, to next year's elections. I wonder how much of that has gone into the government plan. As we did last night, uh, we're splitting things into three chunks. Those are the economy, heritage and identity, housing and combating income inequality, and we will finish with the environment. To my immediate right, the Deputy Chief Minister, Senator Lyndon Farnham. He's also the Minister for Economic Development, Tourism, Sport and Culture. Also here is Deputy Hewland Rowland, uh, Rowland Hewland, sorry, Assistant Chief Minister with Responsibility for Population Policy. Deputy Kirsten Morell, Assistant Minister for Economic Development, Tourism, Sport and Culture. Deputy Gregory Gieder, Minister for Home Affairs and Assistant Minister for the Environment. Plus, we'll also be joined by Deputy Judy Martin, Minister for Social Security, and Deputy John Young, Minister for the Environment. Now, obviously, we can't get them all up here at the same time, so we will be swapping them around while you watch a short video that introduces each session. Don't forget that this is your chance to ask questions of our panel. You can do this on the slido.com and by using the hashtag AskTheMinisters. Now, before we start, here's a short film. A key component of the government plan is supporting our local economy through 2022 and beyond, including taking advantage of international trends and meeting global challenges. We will continue to provide financial support to those areas of our economy who have been particularly affected by the COVID pandemic, but will also look to strengthen our economy over the long term and embrace new opportunities as they arise. The delivery of the island's first economic framework will provide a series of strategic objectives for what we want to see in Jersey's future economy, and we will also continue to diversify by preparing the, for Jersey's future digital connectivity requirements and the next generation of digital networks. We will build and our work to enhance Jersey's international profile and invest in projects to increase productivity support our high street and our retail sector more broadly through a retail strategy. We'll invest in the expansion of Jersey business, allowing them to increase the support and advice available to local companies, particularly small to mid-sized businesses. And we will promote Jersey's arts, heritage and culture by ensuring that at least 1% of all government expenditure is devoted to this area. In 2022, we will also fund the repair and maintenance of Elizabeth Castle and will be further promoting our unique island identity. Welcome back. Now, we're starting this first section, which will last approximately 30 minutes, focusing on the economy, heritage and identity. The economy, as we know, took a hit last year, with some sectors effectively closed down, while most of the working population had to get used to working from home due to the pandemic. The latest business tendency survey has indicated that things were beginning to level out, but we know that there are still some serious issues facing the economy, with supplies, staffing and rising costs. So my first question as we start off this section is to um, the Assistant Chief Minister, Senator Lyndon Farnham. What does this government plan intend to do to help with those issues? Um, uh, good evening, Chris. I think the right at the heart of our economic planning is sustainability. Not only do we want to nurture our existing industries, but we want to make sure 
we create um, new commercial sectors, new industries. The second, uh, probably and equally as important, goal is improving productivity. That's about increasing our economic output without increasing the resources we need uh, to deliver that. Of course, we're all now thinking about the environment, so we want to make sure our economy operates within sensible environmental um, limits, and I firmly believe that we, we embrace that in the economy. It will put us in, in good stead uh, to grow in, in, into the future. Um, also key is the development of a, a more highly skilled uh, a workforce. So those are the key um, elements, but for the, for the longer term, it's sustainability and productivity. A lot of themes to pick up there tonight, and hopefully um, our, those watching online will use slido.com um, to our, put their questions forward to ministers, which we will do our best to get through all of them this evening. Um, let's just start uh, off with um, paying for, for some of all of this, because, of course, support, government support has been vital to a number of sectors um, throughout uh, the last 18 months. That is continuing. Um, some of it's being reduced, of course. Um, you still got enough money to pay for it all. Um, yes, absolutely. We, we've, uh, of course, we had an economic shock uh, and a shock to the Treasury with the, the COVID um, pandemic. I think the government intervention there has managed to sustain and keep most of our, our jobs um, and businesses operating. Um, we have actually haven't spent quite as much money as we originally planned, but we have put in, for example, into the payroll system well over £100 um, million, uh, million pounds. We've also, in our economic um, development budget, we've got additional funding built into the next two years of the government plan to help, help us out, um, to help sort of get back towards a more normal economy, which we're predicting for 2023, 2024. So we're well funded uh, to deliver that. And I just wanted to sort of reiterate the point that actually every penny we invest into the economy, we get a return on. Uh, we get a really good uh, a return on. So um, the money we're putting in there, I think, will represent really good investment moving forward. OK, we have got some questions coming in already, and so we'll start with the first one, which I think touches a lot on what you, you've just been talking about. Um, beyond more spending, more borrowing, more taxes and more debt, what's your long-term economic plan for Jersey? The, well, the, the, the long-term economic plan, I alluded to that in, 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 in the opening comment. It's about building an economy based around sustainability and improved productivity. Um, we'll talk about population um, later, in, in the program, but we cannot continue to allow the population to grow at an exponential um, rate, uh, and that's why we have to improve our productivity levels, and that's at the heart of all of our future economic thinking, and maybe we can talk about the new economic framework that we're developing, which ad ad addresses that, but perhaps we can deal with that as we get questions on it. As, as we get questions on it, but uh, talking about population, of course, it's often we link population to a vibrant economy. We need people in. We need people with skills to come into the island. Obviously, that's going into a lot of the thinking that's gone into the population policy due to the debate uh, later this year. Deputy Hewlin, your, your main focus is on that at the moment, isn't it, of course? We, um, we have to come to a balance between our economy, our society, how we look after people, and our environment. And, and it is managing that that is very, very clear. Uh, the challenges are huge, I and mean, we know we haven't had, and the island's been wanting population policy for 20 plus 30 years, maybe. Um, so we're going to bring that forward and uh, be brave enough to do that. Um, the, the, the real issue is going back to getting to the heart of it, I think, is about productivity. And, and I think it is quite clear if you look at, say, the productivity of the finance sector over the last 20 or 30 years. I mean, it's probably it's halved, if not worse than halved, in that period of time. So that's the amount of income that each person in the finance sector brings into their particular businesses. That is not sustainable. Um, and so we have got to work really hard on, on supporting innovative ways, bit technology, AI, robotics, all these things that are scary for the future, but are going to be absolutely fundamental for our future. Um, we, we have to bring that together. We have to ensure that our, our island um, is um, skilled correctly. We, we, have, we have plenty of people, but I'm not sure they're all doing the right thing. So we need to encourage them, nurture them, into, to, to be brave enough to develop new skills, cross skills, e in order to make sure that we are as, shall we say, as self-sufficient as possible, which we never will be, but as possible. So would you agree that the, the recruitment crisis that we're hearing about is more of a skills crisis? I would suggest so. 
Yes, I would suggest so. We, we, we're, we're not sure where we are at the moment in the numbers of people. I think anecdotally, everybody's talking about we may, not, we may not have as many people as we had here last year. We need the facts, the data for that, which we're working hard on collecting. But we don't know who, who, who we need to replace and why. I think the key is to make sure that skills coming into the island are absolutely essential because for new innovative ideas bringing to us and come over and, and, and transfer those skills to existing people. But we need to ensure that we're ready to receive those, those skills and, um, and do the further learning, the adult learning, et cetera, the education from our young at the outset. We, we've got to address that and, and do that collectively. It's all our responsibility to do that as an island. Okay. Got another question now before we will go to a uh, uh, guest joining us on Zoom. Um, before that, do you believe that the public finances are in a better shape now than they were in 2018? And if so, why? Well, I'm going to ask you, Senator, <laughs> ah. <laughs> Just to kick things off. Um, perhaps others can chip Well, in. I, I, I would think um, coming out of the back of the pandemic, um, they're, they're perhaps slightly um, less better than they would have been had we not had a pandemic, but to be clear, they are still um, very strong. Uh, the, the, I mean, our reserves have, have, have never been higher. Uh, and when we talk about borrowing, we, we're, we're borrowing against very strong reserves. We're not in, incurring any net debt. Um, and so we're, we have a very good foundation um, now because of our, our strong financial position to build um, the economy. That, that, co that doesn't mean we, we can be complacent. We have to make sure we think carefully about every penny we spend on developing the economy and investing in it. When we look at the government plan, the, the figures, all, all the budgets combined from all the departments over the next five years, I think we're seeing a, a quite a prudent and pragmatic approach to, to, to running the island. And I think um, it, it, as long as we manage to stick to it, providing we don't, don't get too many more unforeseen challenges, and in this day and age, we, we can't be too sure about that. I think we're very well positioned to um, start returning to, to surpluses in the not too distant future. And when we do that, um, we need to start replenishing our reserves. Again, one thing that's quite interesting, over the last 20 years, our reserves have grown um, by about 800 million pounds, um, the strategic reserve I'm talking about uh, predominantly, in, in investment interest alone. We've put very little money in from surpluses to that, and I think that's a trend we have to change, so we have to, uh, look, to look to drive out surpluses in the future. Okay, let's um, go to our uh, question from uh, Zoom now. We're joined by Andrew Legale, Chairman of the Jersey Milk Marketing Board, also representing the island's dairy farmers. Andrew. Thank you. I the agricultural industry, like hospitality, retail and fisheries, uh, contributes significantly to both the diversity of our economy, the enhancement of our heritage, and the promotion of our island identity. Do the ministers recognize that there is increasing and widespread loss of productive agricultural land in our island, not just to housing, but to manicured orchards and indiscriminate rewilding schemes as well? which could ultimately denigrate our island identity. Andrew, thank you very much indeed. Um, shall we go down the line? We'll, we'll come back to you at the end, uh, Senator. But we'll start with you, Deputy, Deputy Morrell. Thank you. And thank you, Andrew, for the question. There's no question that ag agriculture is intrinsically linked to the island's identity, and that's something that I feel, Andrew feels, and to be honest, we know that most islanders feel. Agriculture is also transforming, and we've seen enormous productivity increases over the past 10 to 20 years. And as a result of that, we've also seen, or in conjunction with that, we've also seen the number of herds reducing, the number of growers reducing. And so there, there are all sorts of pressures on the agriculture industry, including land, as um, Andrew's just said. It is, it is the case that um, some land is being used for or manicured orchards, as you said, and I think these sorts of things do need to be looked at. Um, we do have to understand how the existing laws and regulations are helping to keep land in agriculture, but also how they're potentially being used to, to skirt around and, and change some things out of agriculture. Um, it, 
there is no hard and fast rule and some of those orchards are being used for production of apples and that is an agricultural activity as well and so to my mind it's something that we do need to look at but it's not a simple case of just saying you have to stop this you have to stop that we know we've got the island plan coming up and we know that there are some fields being looked at for the use for housing this is as deputy hewlin was saying the many competing pressures on this very tiny island. We need to house people. We also need to maintain ag agriculture as part of our, not just as part of our identity, in fact, but as a thriving industry. In my view, it does have a, th a future and a thriving future, but it will evolve. And I do know that people such as Andrew and his colleagues, they've done enormous amounts over the past few years to, to improve the efficiency, the productivity of, of their industry. And that's something that, whilst I have responsibility for agriculture, um, I'm going to support and certainly on the skills front, that's something we're already working on to try and bring more people, young people, into an industry, which is incredibly interesting and at the heart of this island life. Deputy Guido, I just want to pick up on some of that. Um, of course, you've got responsibility as Assistant Minister of the Environment. Um, is there a way of marrying up sustainable farming, more sustainable farming, with our ambitions for, the, for climate change and for the environment? Uh, absolutely. Actually, they, they match quite a bit. Um, it's, uh, it's especially true in uh, potato farming. Uh, the potato farmers have uh, a big problem, which is um, nematodes in the um, in the, so uh, the soil that uh, damage the skin of the potatoes. Uh, one very easy way to get rid of them is to put a lot of chemicals, nematicides, uh, in the ground, and uh, that kills them, and you have a very nice um, harvest. Uh, however, <coughs> we're trying to reduce the, the number. First of all, internationally, more and more of those products are being um, made illegal, uh, and we're trying to reduce their use here. One of the easiest way of reducing their use uh, is to rotate crops and uh, not have potatoes every year in the same place. Um, rotating crop done properly captures carbon. So we can actually do some of the ca ca carbon capture in the island and sell, sell it for, um, for credits uh, or use it ourselves for credits. So it's one way where uh, the two things are actually getting in conjuncture where you know, we're actually helping the environment, helping carbon neutrality and uh, farming better. Um, Deputy Hulin, obviously there's issues with housing our population, the, our, the policy you're developing with, uh, with, with population of course will have to take in account some of the issues that Andrew's raised about losing agricultural land. Won't well you? as I said it's, it's the three competing challenges we have with, with uh, the economy, the society and the environment. Um, I mean, I, um, to, to refer to Andrew, I think as an island, um, or any small island states, or even countries, would love to have a globally known brand that they can reference. And we've got two, um, Andrew's Magnificent Cows and the Jersey Raw Potato. Um, that, that is something that should be actually cherished and, and nurtured, because not only it contributes and helps us on the global stage with everything else we wish to do, from finance to, to tourism, as well as well we know. <coughs> Um, I, I think the challenge we have, and, and we, we can talk about, I know Andrew's worry is, is the loss of land, but I think we've got to look at it from the other way around and encourage more people to go into that, into that particular industry. And I mean, I, I don't want to bore you, but I worked on a farm when I was uh, 17 for a summer, and it taught me one thing and one thing alone. Farming is hard work. I'm off to London. It's a lot easier there. <laughs> and so we have to make it attractive and give people the skills and the support to go in to support these industries <coughs> and businesses from from, from, from the grassroots. Thank you. So, Farnham, obviously, uh, future economy programme, no doubt farming, agriculture will form a pillar of that. It was one of our main yes, industries yeah. many mm -hmm. years ago. It's, it's hu hugely important. We were having this discussion at um, Council of Ministers' meeting just the other day. It might have been yesterday, actually, when we're, we're, we're looking ahead at the um, importance of our, of, of, of our long-standing industry, such as agriculture. Um, and, and tourism, and the thread of agriculture and tourism, tourism runs about through a, just about everything we do and see in the island. And if we didn't have um, farming, there'd be a huge cost to maintaining our landscape in the way it currently is. I mean, we talked about sort of other the, the need without farming for other expensive agri-environmental schemes, where we'd be paying landowners to keep the fields green rather than putting them to productive use. So it's hugely important, and we mustn't lose sight of that. OK, Andrew, thank you very much for your question. Any feedback for our panel from what you've heard? Don't know if you heard that, Andrew. Have you got any feedback for our panel from what you heard? Sorry, I beg your pardon. Sorry, I'm not concentrating. 
Um, well, thank you very much for the encouraging comments, but I, I think that it's, um, it's important to understand that um, we've got a rural economy strategy in, um, which is being uh, formulated at the moment. Um, and I hope that within that, there will be greater control of the use of productive agricultural land in the island. Uh, if, we, if we enter into an insidious creep uh, of, of taking little bits of land here, there and everywhere away from productive agriculture, we will lose in pretty short time those two global brands that um, uh, Deputy Rowland just referred to. OK, thank you very much, Andrew. We will hear from you later on uh, in this broadcast. Um, don't forget, uh, you can get your questions to ministers by um, joining at slido.com and using, using the hashtag Ask the Ministers. And we're going to do that now. Um, this is a question well, aimed at um, the Deputy Chief Minister, but I think we may have some others who, who, who may have a view on this. Um, does the Deputy Chief Minister think that pursuing the legalisation of cannabis is a good diversification of our economy? Uh, I mean, I'm, I think there is a... Uh, I mean, that's, that could um, refer to a number of, of things. We, we're not planning to legalise cannabis for recreational um, use. We are um, creating um, a, an industry for the production, for the, the, the cultivation and, and, uh, and, and manufacture of, of cannabinoids for, for use in, in medicines. Um, so I do think that is an extremely uh, productive use of agricultural land because um, if the industry succeeds and there's a, um, there's a lot of, of I investment and careful planning going it, into it at the moment, it will create some significant economic returns, not just to the Treasury, but in terms of, uh, of careers and, and um, new opportunities for, for jobs. In, in the sector. So the answer to that medicinal cannabis industry, yes. The legalisation of cannabis for, um, for recreational use, I think, it, it, it is something that will come, um, but it's certainly not on the agenda uh, for this government. These things tend to move quite quickly, don't they? I mean, it's not so long ago we were hearing in the States about whether or not medicinal cannabis would be, whether the rules on that would be changed, whether the law with that would change. Um, Deputy Morell, with your um, responsibilities in, in um, economic development, the, minister, uh, the chief, uh, Deputy Chief Minister mentioned about the Treasury, Treasury's gain. I read recently about the possibility of taxing uh, medicinal cannabis that's grown here for 20%. For is that, you know, it's got to pay its way, I suppose, but is that going to stifle industry that's, that's just, just, just arrived? I don't believe so, because... From the outset, as I understand it, and this actually goes back to when I was on the scrutiny panel um, asking questions of Senator Farnham, it was quite clear from the outset that there would be a tax regime um, for the medicinal cannabis industry to fit into, and it was strongly hinted that that would likely be 20%. And so from the beginning, that's been the message. Whilst I haven't been involved in any of the work to do with developing the industry, I've no doubt that um, Senator Farnham and his team relayed that to the companies looking to come in and, and grow cannabis um, for medicinal purposes. And so they came here with their eyes open, that there would be a 20% tax regime and that they would have to pay that. They've done their sums and they believe that they can thrive as businesses whilst also paying that 20% tax. OK, thank you. Um, let's go back to our Slido questions now. Population control or the lack of population control is the biggest problem we face. It affects everything, our infrastructure, health services and other aspects of island life such as housing supply. Why has this current government and previous governments failed to come up with a sustainable population policy? Deputy, you probably weren't in the government uh, when much of this was argued about before, but why, why are we at this stage? Why haven't I mean, we done it? I, I think I said in my previous preamble that uh, we've been waiting for one for 20 to 30 years and um, it's fallen on four. I wasn't. I was still I'm very much a Jerseyman, but uh, <laughs> living in London, um, I was very much. Um, um, yeah, I've risen. I've risen to the challenge, um, and um, I wasn't in the government until a year ago. So um, I'm prepared to, to run with it and do what I can and deliver the best I possibly can. Um, I think it, it, it has been lacking. It's not very fair to blame previous governments, but I think it has been lacking to have some. Um, sort of clear direction to, to to lead other decisions as far as population is concerned, um, and you know let's look forward to, to to what we can deliver instead of um, 
instead of you know thinking about the past. History is good for learning from. Let's learn from it. OK. Um, don't forget, you can get your questions through on slido.com. On there, there's a function where you can upvote those questions, which means um, they go to the top of the queue and get asked first. We've only got about five or so minutes left on this segment before we move on. OK, our next question. Do what does island identity mean to each minister? I think this is probably one for you to start with, um, Deputy Morrell. Um, it means so much to, to me personally. It's, it's everything about this island that we're proud of and that we want other people to see. Um, it's the community that works together to further our own lives so that individually, as families, as small communities and as the island, we are constantly moving forward and prospering. For, for me, island identity is that community prospering together. That's built on a number of things, everything from the brands that have been mentioned, such as you know, Jersey Cow, Jersey Royal Potatoes, to our built heritage, which is everything from dolmens, 6,000 years old, all the way through to the bunkers that were built in the occupation, the farmhouses that we see around us, um, the green fields. All, I believe we take all of this, it, you know, we kind of subsume it in ourselves, and, and, it, and through that we then work together to, to make Jersey a better place. It doesn't matter how long you've been here, how long your family's been here, we all have a part to play in Jersey prospering in the future. And it's that prosperity which is our identity, I believe. Deputy Gida. I agree 100%. I mean, I'm, um, I'm probably the more recently arrived of, uh, <laughs> in, in, at this, uh, sorry, <coughs> in this company. Uh, uh, and um, I pretty much had the choice to move anywhere in the world. I could have worked or, or established roots anywhere in the world. And uh, when I discovered Jersey, it was quite clear that this was a different place. Um, and it's not just because it looks nice and it's uh, you know, comfortable to live in. Uh, it does have an identity. It is, it is a special place. And I've been around the world quite a few, time, sorry, quite a few times. Uh, so I, I, I do accept that, uh, that it is a special place and that we must try to find what makes it special. Because it's, it's also a melting pot. Uh, where We have many cultures coming in. There's a majority of English people. There's now very, very strong communities from Madeira and, and Poland. Uh, we're getting new, uh, uh, new countries, immigrants coming in. Um, so, so it, and uh, of course, this is not new because before that you had French, you had Italians. Uh, so it's, it's happened throughout the history of Jersey and it's managed to, a little bit like, the, like America, make a melting pot and keep that identity. So I think that's, uh, that's an investment of the past that we must absolutely keep in the future. Deputy Hewlands, question, same question to you, but you, you went away and came back. What did um, the island, how did the island draw you back? Uh, I, was, uh, I was always going to return. Um, I was born and bred here, family goes back for years, that doesn't make any difference. It's, um, you know, from my lifestyle, I've had great pride in the island. The history is irrelevant, really. It's my personal pride in the island. Uh, my, my, my wife and I were always, always going to return. And I go back to, it, it's that word pride. Um, I want to be able to, part of our identity, to share that. So I have got many friends from London that come and stay with us. I wish to show them the island. I take them into the state's building and show them what I do now. I think they're a bit surprised, but, um, and, but, but I do that with, 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 with a deep pleasure and pride in what I'm actually doing. You, you drive around the island, you look at the Andrew's cows, you, 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 you go to St. Juan's Bay, the most beautiful place on the planet. Um, we must protect all these things. And, and just it, it's that pride to share and to welcome people to the island. I, I, you know, everybody seems to think that we're closed. If somebody comes to this island, um, whether it's for nine months, two years, five years, or forever, they should be equally welcomed and, 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 and contribute. So it's, it's pride in the island that I want to share and enjoy. OK, and Senator Farland, briefly. Well, everything, everything that um, Kirsten, Gregory and Roland said, plus unique sense of pride. When, when it, nothing I enjoy more than talking to people about Jersey explain, and showing them our beautiful island. People who come to, the, to Jersey for the first time never cease to be amazed at how beautiful um, it is, explaining our unique system, our parish system, our political system. And, uh, you know, we must, we must hang on to that. And I pay, just pay tribute to the work that Deputy Labby is doing at the moment on island identity and, and urge islanders to, to seek that out and have a look okay. at some of that. OK, mm -hmm. um, absolutely. There is another side, of course. Um, far too many people, um, ask Penny, says Penny, are literally surviving, not thriving. Young people will not be able to afford to live in the island. You cannot attract experienced people to move here due to the cost of living. Prices of everything, including utilities, are rising. What answers do you have? 
Senator. So, I, I mean, actually, the last point you made, um, utilities, our, our utilities over here, um, perhaps with the exception of the um, issues surrounding gas at the moment, are, are quite competitively uh, are priced. But, of course, it is the single biggest, biggest issue we and any future government will have in the short to medium term until we resolve it. That is the cost of living here, and that's, in, 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 in my uh, uh, opinion, um, which is based on some, some, some good information, that the housing crisis is, is at the centre of this, and it is a crisis. We almost are going to need to declare a state of emergency soon to um, resolve the issue. We've got a section coming up on housing, so perhaps we can go into a, a, a bit more uh, detail there. But it is hugely concerning. I mean, it was going back to when I was growing up in Jersey, you know, housing was expensive then, but I think if you apply, if, if you apply like for like now, it's even more out of reach for, for, for young people. That is the biggest issue, and we'll, we can address what we're going to do about it in the, in the next section, perhaps. Yeah, I think we're going to move on to that shortly. I want to get one more question in, and this is about digital economy. Um, what's being done to support our digital economy, and how can we be expected to compete globally in this area as just a small island? So we were very proud to receive officially the to be known as the, the fastest jurisdiction in the world on on internet um, internet access. We've just um, we've just achieved that. What I think I think we're leading there. So actually, that's created a foundation um, for business to embrace uh, technology. Of course, we're very ably supported by Digital Jersey uh, 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 and the team there who have got um, uh, a, a number of, uh, of very um, pro well, proactive. Uh, work streams going on at the moment. If I can just draw attention to, I think, one of the most important aspects of their work, and that's the development of the Digital um, Academy, which started just over a year ago and is proving to be very successful. Okay. Um, Deputy Morrill, you've had quite an involvement in the digital economy, haven't you? Um, not, not as much as perhaps I'd have liked, but um, th there's, no that out. <laughs> yeah, there's no question that, um, you know, data and information, digital information, is going to be at the heart of Jersey's development going forward, not just economic development, but also the development of our society. Um, as a government, we're trying to get on top of that um, through various IT projects because um, there is a need to digitise everything from health records through to government records, etc. But um, there's also another element to it, which is, I mentioned data. I, I have responsibility for data protection, and I think it's something that Jersey can do, which is to maintain our strong privacy regulations um, in line with Europe and use that as a flag to inspire other companies etc to use Jersey as a jurisdiction to store data that's just one element but a lot of it is driven by a digital policy team and digital Jersey. Okay I'm afraid time is um, getting the better of us now we've got to move on thank you very much indeed to Deputy Kirsten Morrell and to Deputy Roland Hewden for joining us we're going to go for a video which now which will introduce our next section. We have taken steps throughout the COVID pandemic to support those in our society who are most vulnerable and I've been especially proud of the community task force and the support offered by CRESS. We have used fiscal stimulus funding to provide extra support to islanders looking to get back to work and this plan offers proposals to support job seekers in 2022 and beyond. This year's government plan builds on this to help to improve the standard of living for all islanders, we will be looking at new ways to support those with long-term health conditions to return to or to remain in employment. And low wage earners will see the benefit of improved minimum wage rate, which will be set at 45% of the mean earnings from the start of 2022. Housing is one of the biggest challenges we face. Historically, we just haven't built enough homes. A shortage of supply sends prices up. More and more young people are giving up hope of ever getting a foot on the property ladder. Since becoming Minister eight months ago, I've made it my mission to accelerate supply. It's not going to happen overnight, but there is hope it is going to happen. Andium Homes alone will complete another 50 homes by the end of this year, 160 in 2022, and by the end of 2022, they'll begin allocating the 320 homes due for completion in 2023. Together with other agencies, we should see 900 new homes by the end of 2023, thousands more by the end of the decade. I'm trying to ensure the housing pipeline extends further into the future so that we can plan better, be ready to start building when sites become available, and crucially, make sure we're building the right homes to meet the demand. Supply is key, but we're also looking at what else government can do. 
have already taken action to restrict foreign investment in the Jersey property market. We want all tenants to feel protected and secure in Jersey. We've frozen Andean rents for 2022 and continue to work on our fair rents plan. We have some funding for assistance with purchase and are working out the best ways to target that help. As I say, there's no overnight solution, but getting government collaborating better and listening more to the industry. With that, we stand a better chance. Welcome back um, to our panel. We've had a few changes of personnel up here. We're joined by the um, Social Security Minister, Deputy Judy Martin, and also by the Environment Minister, Deputy John Young. Otherwise, we're uh, as we were before. Um, I'd like to introduce this next section on housing and combating income inequality by picking up a few things that were just said then. Over the last few years, there's been a massive building programme in Jersey to supply homes for people on low incomes, to encourage people to live in their home parishes and to get people onto the housing ladder. Yet we hear about rising rents, a lack of affordable homes, and simply that the cost of buying a home is way beyond the reach of many. A few moments ago, you would have heard um, the Deputy Chief Minister saying that uh, we should be declaring a housing crisis. Um, so the government plan says it is aiming to reduce income inequality, to improve the standard of living by improving the quality and affordability of housing, improving social inclusion, and also by removing barriers to and at work. Um, Minister, if you can, and we'll hear from the rest of the panel as well, no doubt, um, how will this plan help to do all of that? Looking I'm looking at you, Deputy Chief Minister. Ah, um, I was hoping you were looking at something. Um, <clears throat> so, uh, as, as Deputy Labby, um, I think, summed up very well in his, um, his uh, a, a briefing just then, uh, the, it, it, it's the simple issue is we haven't allowed supply to keep up uh, with demand. Our, our, our population has grown way ahead of, of the housing um, supply. On, on, on top of that, a buoyant economy um, and, uh, um, you know, our, our um, a, a economy per head per capita has been very strong, low interest rates, um, banks lending significant multiples of income has created an insatiable uh, a, a, a demand which has led to a spiral in, in, in house pricing way over the, um, you know, the cost of living over the same um, period of time. So we, we, we simply have to put on rocket boosters the building program to increase the supply. Equally as important is we have to provide the, um, uh, the ability to enable youngsters to uh, uh, afford this and that is um, perhaps providing, you know, loans of of, of 100 percent or facilitating that because even now to to find a 10 percent uh, deposit on a on a property is completely unrealistic for most young people. So a combination of, of increased um, supply and, and and far more visionary ways of of putting people into homes and finding ways for them to pay to those homes. We, we quite sort of in our, in the British culture, we sort of base everything around 20 or 25 um, year mortgages. Well, perhaps we should be looking at financing, allowing people to finance the entire cost of their homes over much longer periods of time and providing um, government support to do that. Um, Deputy Martin, um, now more than ever, we're seeing disparities in income inequality and standards of living being affected. Um, obviously, COVID's had a huge part to play in that. How is this plan going to aim to tackle those issues? Well, we did have a, we've always had an aim to get to 45% uh, of the average earnings. We've, uh, it should have been achieved in 2020, obviously, with COVID. We've actually achieved that. So it's, it's gone up 90p an hour. But I was at Caritas yesterday for a completely different thing. And as soon as they've got the new uh, living wage for next year, the the employment forum i will be going out to ask um, to consult on the living wage now i think there'll be a lot of industries that can take that and there'll be some that won't when i got put the 922 in the assembly uh, there was a lot of concern with agriculture so we need to find out who can take the living wage and we don't want to hold those back so we might need to do something else for the others um getting people really um trained again reskilling we're doing a lot of that down the department we are paying some employers to take people on just to got the confidence to give them a try that's worked well we, we, we got some fiscal stimulus money and we got 79 starts for a six months job and um and then we've got other uh 
I think some are six weeks and some are three months. And, you know, we want to keep get people into work and uh, really, you know, and he help them sort of earn as much as we can. We're doing the housing. I mean, we, the uh, South Hill will give us about 13 million profit if it stays as it is, but there's an amendment in to uh, make it, some of it more affordable. And then the more you, the cheaper houses you buy, uh, build for people, absolutely, you will have less to invest anywhere else. So it's a, it's a decreasing circle. OK, we've got lots to talk about and we've got lots of questions coming in on this, but I just want to pick you up before we talk about the environment briefly before we move on to our questions from our uh, people who are watching. You mentioned living wage. Are you talking there about a national living wage, Jersey's equivalent of having of one? Yes, well, Caritas sat down and it's £10.96 and they normally bring... They're, they'll be uh, working it out and the man said it'll be ready around March next year, which would be absolutely great. Then the employment forum can go out, consult with all the people they do. They do it really well. Because that didn't happen this time. I consulted, my officers consulted, we did it in-house because they couldn't go out and people came to us. We consult with all the same people and um, with everything else. Um, it did, you know, it's 8.32 now and it's 9.22 it's going to be. And so, but I have promised that the living wage will be consulted on. It won't be 10.96, they told me it will go up. So I've got no idea what it'll be, but they'll tell me that and that's what we consult on next and year. Briefly, is that going to replace the minimum wage? Well, so you, if we we have a uh, live, sorry, we have the minimum wage which is in law. Now, if the minimum wage is a set at the living wage, it will be the living wage amount in the minimum wage. <laughs> that's the law. Well. That's the okay. law. So that, that's how I've got it. You know. Okay, so we're going beyond the median of um, yeah. average earnings, aren't well, we? Well, they're going to go out and consult on it okay. and because they, they know it, they've been doing it since we've had the minimum wage 2005 and um, it was just this year they couldn't go out. Okay, thank you. Um, Minister, thank you for joining us. Um, so, obviously, housing crisis, pressure on the environment for more homes, more fields um, going under concrete. Well, look, I think Lyndon has put his finger on it that we've neglected supply for far too many years. Um, what we've done historically in Jersey's government or the states is to wait until a f unfulfilled need arises and then try and, and put it right. Um, what has happened, of course, is we've seen a, a population growth which exceeded uh, very, very substantially by a country mile, in fact, the target set in the last, last island plan. Um, the new island plan, which uh, I've been working on throughout COVID and is going to the planning inquiry next month, uh, public inquiry that is, and the states are due to debate in March, will set the policies and the targets for what we need to do about affordable homes. And in a nutshell, what that plan will do, if adopted, is to double the rate of completion of houses from four, when I say houses, from dwelling units, from 400 a year to 800 a year. That means a plan of 4,000 homes in all over five years. As the housing minister said in the video, some of those homes are planned to come from government-owned sites and what the government plan does, which we're publishing and talking today, is gives the money side of that. But also as well, we've got the sites that are in progress under development, but we've got this key component of some proposed... There is a proposal to zone a proportion. It is a smallest proportion of open land that I could put forward to be able to... Um, plug that gap because not only have we got the numbers of homes but I think it's clear from the evidence that we need to allow some limited uh, limited growth for sustainability reasons in our parish communities that the previous discussion spoke about because of the age profile of demographics in those communities um, the proposed the plan that I put forward uh, I believe does that in the least damaging way make sure those sites are tightly uh, uh, confined to the built-up area envelopes and are sustainable in every way with all the facilities you need. Um, having said that, there are lots of contrary opinions. Um, we have got f uh, a number of propositions to take those sites out of the plan. Uh, what I've had to do, and it's caused some upset, is to put forward a reserve list and say to the inspectors, look, if those sites are taken out, we could end up with a very unbalanced mix of sites which would have the effect 
of, I believe, undermining the integrity of the island plan policies over the decades that have kept the countryside so special. I want to see that. So I've asked inspectors, should those things happen, have a look at this reserve list. And I think we've a journey to come now. And I'm really looking for state's members to rise above the short-term politics and face this crisis. We have to provide for our young people on this island. And it's trying to do that in a way that we can all live with, if you like. It's, it's nothing, I, I take no pleasure in it, but it's my job to put it forward. OK, thank you very much, I'm afraid. We're going to move on back to our questions from uh, Slido, and please keep ringing them in and also keep up voting. Um, what is the government's proactive response to the increasing rents and cost of living that is driving so many workers away? Do you want to start us off on yes. that, Senator? Um, I'm, 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 we've... Um, and uh, and um, Homes... Um, rent freeze uh, last year. I believe there's going to be another one um, uh, coming up this year. So that that that's helped. Of course, income support elements um, do take for 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 for, for the rep for those people that are um, uh, um, I I in receipt of, of, of that generally neutralises um, the rent income. But of course, outside of those sectors, there's a huge there's a huge private um, a, a sector that are struggling. With, with increased rents, and that's as a result of the, um, the situation we just talked about, supply um, and demand. I think there's some, there's some potentially some quick wins here, because when we look, we look at the way we use housing as a society, we, we soak up much more housing per head per capita than we did 30 or 40 years ago. There was a report that came out, I think, at the turn of the last century, sounds a long time ago, that's when it started in politics, I think it was called the Cootie Report, that, that identified that we, you know, with, with divorce rates increasing, children leaving home at younger ages and, and going, you know, in our day, I, you know, we stayed at home and, and then till we, got our, till we got married or we got our own premises, uh, to our, our, own, our own home. But that's changed, so that, that just has, has enhanced the, the, the problem, if you like. So um, it, it's a huge challenge. I think what quick win, as I was going to say, is we, we need to look at the way um, we... We, we manage the housing. So, I mean, if you look at St Helier, for example, there are, there are great swathes of St Helier where you have commercial, office and, and, and residential in one spot. Some of the offices are now lying empty. Some of the commercial are lying empty, as we've seen the economy reshape and refocus. And, of course, the main office buildings moving more towards the waterfront. So that's freeing up stock. And we can quickly... Um, get onto that. We can we can we can get some some developments in. I also think we need to look at the housing law, changing the housing law to create a, a tier for key worker accommodation. Um, uh, so, so that that I mean that that will provide. I mean, the developers it's, it's can get onto problem, that and provi yeah. pr provide that. But um, and then thus putting an end to sort of the the reliance on 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 bedsit land. I think if people are if we're going to give people permission to come and live and work in Jersey, we need to give them permission. To, uh, to be housed in decent accommodation. Uh, Deputy Marsden, I mean, a lot of the housing that we're seeing come, that's been built recently has been in your district, hasn't it, in St Helia. Is St Helia, are we going to start seeing St Helia given a bit of a break in terms of uh, the, the next phase of building? Um, possibly, but there is a lot of um, unused office space and, you know, it might not get loads of uh, units of accommodation but it, it's not good for office because people are moving down to the waterfront or uh, offices that are made for them and they want all their people in working in the same place. So I think St Helia has taken quite a lot, but, uh, you know, if, it, if it's there and if it's a, a run-down office building, we can get units of accommodation. I actually live in St Clements and a lot of people think St Clements is, you know, built, built around. But again, those, every time those homes were finished, within, and the majority of rental, I think there was one part, probably about 30 of, of one side were, were to buy, people have moved in as the block next door has not even been finished. That's how desperate they are to move in and need in homes. So it's, you know, I do live in St Clements. I've had people contact me saying we can't use these fields. And my answer is... I needed a home. Those people needed a home. When do you, we know people need homes. Okay. 
Um, and I think, as I think the Environment Minister has done as well as he can to try and be fair. We may move on to that in the next, in the last um, section this evening. We've got lots of questions, so forgive me. I'm going to move things on. The rich get richer, the poor get poorer. This is the next question. Uh, this is the reality in this island, and there's no hope for those who struggle financially. What are, what's the government, what are you going to do about it for a real social equality and fairness in our society? If you'd like to take that one up, panel. Deputy Gita. Yes, I'd like to, <clears throat> I'd like to try at this. Um, Jersey actually is a very, very good place to grow. Uh, there are plenty of opportunities. I mean, <clears throat> let's start from the beginning. Um, I come from France. France has had a 10% unemployment rate structural for all my life. Uh, I've known people who got out of university and then spent three, four years just looking for a job. I'm not talking about you know, whether they were rich or richer or poor, just looking for their first job. I have met third generation unemployed. Dad was unemployed all his life. Granddad was unemployed all his life. That's the situation in many other countries in the world. In Jersey, first of all, if you're ready to do any sort of work, you'll find a job tomorrow morning. Eight o'clock, you can go and start working. Second, if you don't like it very much, there's another one, better. If you're ready to learn, and we provide the education, it is available in Jersey, there's another one. My, um, my fiancé, used to teach um, IT classes uh, at Highlands. And she saw a whole generation of immigrants who'd come in under registration, uh, under the registration system, so they were allowed to be barmaids or barmen, went to the courses, got the IT skills, on their five years anniversary, got a bank job, got a job in finance. So, uh, and again, I've seen the rest of the world this is, if you're prepared to do the work, if you're prepared to learn, learn the skills, this is really a place where you can go. There are tons of things, of, uh, of things to do in Jersey. People are prepared to do that, but they still struggle. They still find this a really expensive island to live in. It's a very expensive... Uh, sorry, it's not entirely true. Um, it's, it's completely unbalanced because of housing. Uh, the supermarket prices are the UK supermarket prices. You know, you go to the UK, you spend exactly the same money for the same products. Well, if you, if you shop in the main, <laughs> I, I see that, but if you shop in the main ones, you may get 5% more in Marks and Spencers uh, because they add on, uh, um, sorry, they add on the, uh, the, the, no, no, the they used to add, to add on transport on, on, on top of it. And of course, there is GST. Um, but the, the prices advertised are the same prices as in the UK. So there isn't a big, big difference. Petrol is cheaper. Having a car is way, way cheaper in, in Jersey and almost any other European country. Um, and again, you, you need to try to compare with, uh, with uh, similar things. Um, I was in Paris a, a couple of days ago. I was in London before that. <coughs> uh, try to survive in there. It's not cheap either. Uh, try Moscow. You know, try, try New York. Uh, a, a, a large city is not a cheap place to, to live. Jersey is not bad, except for housing. Okay. And housing is very, very simple. We don't have enough of it. We'll probably return to this, no doubt. Um, our next question, support for social housing is only offered to low earners, but average earners who contribute more are excluded and hard pushed to afford the rental prices here, even more so if they are single parents. Many are being forced to live with parents or friends. What support will be offered to them? Social Security Minister. Yes, I know uh, Deputy Labby, who is a housing minister, is looking at that. Um, we want to look at the, we look at the, uh, the earnings and we want to look at... Um, we, we don't allow single people, even what they earn, that, unless they're a Kelly or something, to go on the list. I mean, it, it, we've got a very small um, criteria for letting people on. The problem being, as, as uh, everyone's just said, we could let them on. But actually, if you've not got the homes, they, they, we're banded. You're band one, two, three, four is the bottom. Um, we'd probably invent a band five. I, everyone I know who've got their sons have come back or daughters in London, they're living with them in their 30s. They're on the list. They're on the local council list. 
but they'll never be housed. They've been on the list for the last six years because there's not enough homes there either. Um, it, it is being looked at. Um, and I know uh, it, Deputy Labby wants to widen the criteria. But again, as I say, it's not it's false hope if we put you on the list and we know we're not going to give you... We're always going to find someone who's going to be a band higher than you for that one bedroom or two bedroom flat. Somebody else. I think one of the points I'd like to make that the island plan proposals are not just about the numbers of homes, it's about to make those homes affordable. And the mechanisms proposed in that of the island plan is that all those sites zoned and the Stokes Zone site will carry a requirement that ho those homes can be occupied by persons that are within who meet the financial criteria that I it's going to be set with the housing minister. Well, I'm certainly the housing minister and I have worked closely together and I think we've got some mechanisms here but I think um, Minister of Social Security has just referred to the current structure of the bans and so on but I think I know the Housing Minister is looking to review that and one of the things I've certainly flagged up and it's a possibility it's a proposal in the island plan is what we call right sizing a right sizing arrangement so that people that want to uh, right size in later in life and release a family home for younger ones to occupy in a home and or indeed dare I say it release some money so they can live off to their final years I think those are the sort of issues that there are policies in that draft plan which is out for inquiry which I think will help make sure those homes will go those homes that are zoned will go to those in the most need affordable needs but of course that you know those that can afford it will have the private market so it's about getting that balance between the two sides of the market, and I think the proposals will improve that significantly if they're adopted. OK, about that balance, I think this next question then refers to that. Why is SOJDC building luxury apartments when we're in a housing crisis? Can someone explain the rationale? Uh, please try. It's pretty simple. Uh, you have demand and offer. Demand is that big, and offer is that big. The fact that they don't match make the prices go up. And that's our biggest problem, and we really have to understand that. If we put more money into the market, if we gave everybody a million pounds to buy a house, houses would cost two million pounds, because the same number of people would try to buy the same number of houses. So it is absolutely critical that we build more. Now, it is much easier to build an expensive home than to build a cheap one. But when you build it, your market starts balancing and the prices start slowing down. And it is absolutely, absolutely critical that we slow down the prices. Again, we're trying to do a scheme to help first-time buyers acquire their home because uh, getting a mortgage is extremely difficult. But that's putting more money to that, into that group to try to fit into this. So it's very, very important that we, um, that we increase the supply any way we can. One way, again, the, the easiest thing is to, to tell developers, go develop makes expensive stuff, that increases the market, the prices go down. So it's, it's, it's not uh, obvious at, the first, uh, at first sight, but actually increasing the market is how you make the prices go down. OK, Deputy Young, I know you want to come in there, but I think this next question kind of builds on what we've just been hearing from Deputy Gida. Um, for those paying rent, it's really unfair not having it taken into account with, say, your tax calculation. Those paying a mortgage have tax relief. What's the reason for this still? How come income support is added as household income when applying for student finance? Those who own a property, our questioner says, are better off. Uh, that's not a, a, a matter in my, in my territory, as it were. Um, not so much in your territory, but maybe you want to come into that. But uh, Deputy Gida, do you, do you have a view on, on that question? from what you just said about um, housing supply? Well, about the, uh, the tax, um, the only part of your uh, mortgage that's taken out of your tax is your uh, interest. It's the interest you pay in your mortgage. What you repay, actually, it's, it's, uh, it's money that you put aside, that you become richer with. Uh, so it's not an expense. Um, and that's why it, it has culturally been um, allowed as a deduction. I don't think that will last for very long. I think that the plans as that, uh, are that um, uh, in interest on your mortgage are not going to be deductible anymore. Ju again, for, for the sim very simple reason of trying to be fair with everybody. The state of Jersey, when it was still the state of Jersey, 
talked about that once before. It didn't happen. Deputy Young, sorry, we, we you were yeah, we've gone slightly up, different to what so you. So I was wanting to pick up the point about the housing developments and SOJDC. I think this goes back. I think the issue is that the state set the objectives. It did so with the previous web, and now we've got SOJDC to say, look, we will hand the land to that development body because they can do it better than government themselves, but they won't give it any money. And so what the challenge is for that body is to create a mix of development which includes, which includes all the public domain facilities, all the uh, parts that, as well as homes that go with a decent place to live. And I think what that body is trying to do is to find where that line is. I'm personally clear there has to be a decent proportion of affordable homes. And I personally in that area, because I go back to when the first housing development took place on the waterfront, the states had exactly the same debate. And what did we end up? They said 50-50. And we split up, we built a, a development, we put one half being affordable and the other half being open market. And I think that tells you at its heart that mixed communities are good. But what I can't predict, we just don't know, and it's up to Edo SOJDC to give us the numbers, what the consequences of those proportions of affordable homes will have on the actual development itself. We don't want to end up with a poor quality development. We want to end up with a decent quarter of St Helier. And so we're going to have that debate soon. I hope we get that information to help us make that judgment. If it stays the same, there will be £13 million that can be reinvested into assisting and assist people to buy other houses. So it's, you know, you, if, we, if it's all uh, affordable, then it actually we may come out uh, actually not making any money. And, and you know, uh, Snow Hill is a, a very, uh, it's a very not good site. <laughs> OK, let's move away from... South Hill. I'm South Hill. South, yeah, um, South we'll move away from housing just on our last question, I think, our final question we've got for um, this segment. Um, income inequality. Jersey doesn't have any free school meals provision. How can we expect children to learn to their full ability if they're hungry? How can we expect education to be a means of social mobility if less affluent pupils don't have a fair chance because they're hungry? into the second year of caring cooks who are doing free school meals there's a lot of primary schools that can't have them cook in their schools because they just haven't got the facility um, do we just give everybody a free school meal when probably two-thirds of parents are quite happy paying for it um, and we need to find a way that everyone can have a hot school meal and you don't know if he's paying for it and I'm not and we, that's quite easy to overcome with cards and things like that um, but it's like um, with now with doctors and um, with um, all income support and this is between the two uh, government plans I've introduced a scheme all income support P uh, pension plus that's people who are not in income support but don't pay tax see a doctor for 12 pounds and that's everything if you need a blood test anything and all children 16 and under are free so we have to look i mean if if somebody says you've got to give every school child a free meal absolutely if that's what you want to do we have to cost it could we find out two-thirds of those children can absolutely pay and we could do other things for that money to help the other third. It might be something else the other third need. Um, th that's why we don't... But there, it, there is a scheme. It's, it's provided by Caring Cooks. I think it finishes this year, evaluated, and then we'll work, roll it out into more schools with more need. There is more need, definitely, but I don't know if it's need for every school child. OK, thank you very much. I'm afraid um, time has moved on. We've got a clock in here, which we can see that you can't. If you've seen Squid Game, it's a bit like that game, red light, green light. We're going to go to our next topic now, which is the environment. This government plan outlines action that the island will take next year to protect our natural and urban environment. We will be bringing to the State's Assembly a carbon neutral roadmap that sets out our plans to ensure that Jersey has the right policies, initiatives and fiscal strategy to address climate change. As part of this work, the Government Plan already includes new investment into our Climate Emergency Fund, established in 2019, which will deploy £23 million to meet the challenges of the climate emergency, including changes to how we travel around the island and how we heat and cool our buildings. 
The Government Plan will continue to deliver funding for the Bridging Island Plan Workstream, which will play its part in contributing to the protection of the island's unique environment. The new island plan will also make progress on several key objectives, including making improvements to our urban environments, investing in traffic calming measures, and develop plans for the new cycle lanes in Hill Street, Don Street and Midvale Road. The Government Plan also outlines how we will fund investment in the public realm and in our island's major capital projects, including the redevelopment of Fort Regents, the sewage treatment works, the office strategy and our new hospital. And the plan also includes the funding we need for improvements to our drainage network, sea defences and our roads. The Government Plan will therefore invest not only in important capital projects, but also in safeguarding and improving the day-to-day -day infrastructure and natural environment that we sometimes take for granted. Okay, welcome back. Our final section this evening looking at the government plan is the environment. Um, really crucial topic, um, but one complaint you could perhaps um, say is often made about um, government plans, not necessarily this one, but there's very little reference to the environment when you read through it. As we know, there is much importance being placed on climate change and sustainability currently, especially with COP26, the climate summit in Glasgow coming up in the next couple of weeks. But governments often get accused of not taking the issue of climate change seriously. Let's begin with that as our starting point. We'll start with the Environment Minister, Deputy Young. Are we taking it seriously? Oh, absolutely we are. I think it's a fair point that the government plan doesn't include a great deal of, of detailed content in that. But what it does do, it sets out the mechanism by which the pump priming um, method that we've chosen to establish this £23 million fund, which will uh, allow us to initiate actions in the short term to, if you like, kick off, pump prime the actions that will follow. And I suppose that what we've had to do, of course, by accident of timing, had we had not had COVID, we'd have had the Citizens' Assembly and the work on the carbon neutral plan a year earlier. Anyway, we've, done, we've had the Assembly, they did a fantastic job, we've got the report, we've had an in-committee debate. Only this week, I've been had the privilege of going through the draft response, the response that has gone to the Council of Ministers on the strategy and also the detailed response. And I'm very pleased to say that will shortly be published. And that, I think, sets out some of the detail that shows the, the strategy that government wants to follow in order to address carbon uh, neutrality. Because the states said, the states set us a goal earlier this year, a uh, year before last, um, we want carbon neutrality by 2030 because it's a climate emergency. We, we've had, what's, things have moved on. We've had Paris. We've had the new climate report that shows that that target, the target set years ago, wasn't good enough. It's too urgent. And therefore, we've got the Paris targets, which are higher. And what we'd be recommending in the new plan is that we've also got the prospect of, well, if the states agree, as well as achieving carbon neutrality by 2030, which does allow us to do what they call offsets, which a lot of people think is kind of cheating, to achieve zero carbon, which Paris requires by 2050. And the only the difference between the key dates is the technology change and the shift that needs to take place between this is a huge sh shift. And I think we've made a decent start. Today, I was very pleased to be part of a webinar with the uh, external um, relations minister with overseas territories talking about this. As a small island, we have a lot of common interest. And I think that is really bodes well for future cooperation and joint working to actually take this forward. OK, I think we've got lots of questions on this, so we're going to go straight into those. Um, and please do keep coming in them in, and don't forget to upvote them. You can do that on slido.com. Um, the environment, the island desperately needs an independent environmental regulator. At the moment, the government investigates itself. Um, the example given here, the Horizon Pollution Prosecution took some six months and achieved an insignificant £10,000 fine at a prosecution cost of some £50,000. Totally ludicrous. Well, let's just, I don't want to, I mean, there was, there was a case, I know the viewpoint of those uh, very genuine uh, group who feel that that prosecution, uh, the outcome of that, um, didn't achieve what they wanted. But as far as I'm concerned, 
I can be very clear this was done properly under the rules and accordance with evidence and law. But there is a point here that I think, and I've been open about this, we do need to look at the ways in which we can move to a greater level of independence within our regulatory structures. Because at the moment, under the one government structure, there are inbuilt potential conflicts that we manage. And at the moment, as I sit here, I do my best and I will make sure as best I can that those conflicts don't create that problem. But in the future, I think going forward, I think having a greater independence or some kind of structure. But that's a big warning here. That's going to cost money. It's going to take time. It's going to take laws to do it. And I suppose one of the things I've asked the team to do is to produce a paper on that so that before I complete my period as minister, um, there will be a report unless I get thrown out before, of course. <laughs> Um, let's go to another question now. Philip, thank you for this and thanks for the flag. Jersey signed up to net zero carbon. The EU, UK, Australia, North America all requires 10% of petrol to contain fuel from renewable sources and duty rates to reflect this. Jersey doesn't require 10% ethanol and is out of step with the rest of the world on duties. Will the government amend the plan to urgently do this? No question that the issues of fuel duty is a huge one for the, f the future implementation of carbon neutrality and zero carbon. I'm pleased to say that the fiscal options, because these all involve money, have received very much attention with a group of members led by my colleague, Tepsi Gida, in recent weeks, uh, who has been able to make progress on this. And I think that those matters are actively under review and I think there is expectations of some early direction coming pretty soon. So my message is watch this space. If Gregory wants to elaborate a bit more, uh, fine. Yes, a little bit. It's actually quite something quite interesting. Um, we think of carbon neutrality today uh, as the exclusive use of electricity. But, for example, right now, you know, tomorrow morning, uh, you can go and buy some biodiesel RD100, which is almost carbon neutral. It's 98, 99 percent carbon neutral. It's been grown. It's been made <coughs> with recovered oils or, and greases and fats. So uh, it's a product that we've, ex you know, that we've grown and then we're putting back into the atmosphere. You can buy this now. Problem is, it's more expensive. It's about 50p more expensive than normal diesel. So, but if so. If, you, if you're ready to invest, if you're ready to, uh, to become carbon neutral, your diesel car can become carbon neutral tomorrow morning. Now, uh, of course, it would be quite interesting to be able to steer people towards using that product or, as Mr. Ozuf suggests, uh, uh, products that uh, cont contain ethanol. Uh, so we are going to look at ways of keeping taxing carbon issued, you know, uh, uh, fossil fuel made uh, fuels and try to favor non fossil fuel made, uh, uh, sorry, non fossil fuel made fuels. Uh, and of course, the, uh, that another one that we will start seeing in, in the years to come is hydrogen. And that's the same thing. So it's still a fuel, it's still something you burn, but it, depending on how it's been made, it can be carbon neutral. So, yes, it is, it is one thing that we're looking at and that we will probably have um, uh, news on this before the end of the year. OK, we'll look forward to that. Momentum is therefore moving in that direction. Um, Deputy Gida, your Assistant Minister, obviously, uh, I think uh, for the environment, we've got a question on trees now. Do you oh. think it's right that Jersey's tree protect protection laws are 100 years behind the UK's? And why do you think that increasing tree protection terrifies some states' members? I, would, I wish I knew. <clears throat> I wish I knew why um, this terrifies some states' members. Not many, fortunately. And uh, I must say that, first of all, uh, an interesting point is that uh, the minister and I immediately agreed, you know, days after we'd been elected and nominated, uh, that it would be something really nice to have and do some sort of tree protection in Jersey. So it's something that we've been working on for three years. And it took that long, with the small hiccups on the way, it took that long to bring a law to the assembly, um, some members of which promptly you know, managed to derail. Uh, and I, I think I can say that they, that they actually derailed it. Now, we are probably the last country in Europe to not have tree protection. Uh, we are doing it. If we do it this year, if we manage this year or early next year, we are doing it 100 years after the UK and, and decades after any other country in Europe. 
so it's something that we are quite late on. And uh, it's funny because we, we, you know, if you drive around the island, the island looks really green. The tree cover in Jersey is about 6% of the land. Greater London has a 20% cover. Greater London, and that's, that's a city. That's one, a city. One of the greenest cities on the planet. Isn't yes, it? it's, it's actually legally a forest. And we've got 50% of green land in Jersey. Half of our land, land is not built upon. But we cannot even match London. So we do have a problem with trees. The other thing about trees is that, um, and that's something that, that's really annoyed me. Um, we are very, very keen on protecting man-built objects. So I have a lovely building, and you say, oh, that must absolutely be protected for the next generations. It's, uh, it's 70 years old, it's, uh, or it's 100 years old. The truth is, at any point, with the right amount of money, you can rebuild it. You could raise it, and if you wanted it again, you'd put people on it, you'd, you'd carve stone, you know, you'd build it in the, in the same fashion. You can actually rebuild it. If you cut down a 150 years old tree, there is no human humanly accessible way of putting it back where it was. That is gone forever, or at least for another 150 years. So to me, it's something that is really, really more important to protect than buildings. And it's about time we were able to do it in Jersey. OK. We were joined um, earlier by Andrew Legale, chairman of the Jersey Milk Marketing Board on Zoom. He joins us uh, once again with a question on climate change. Andrew. Thank you. Um, well, there is virtually universal recognition of the need to take drastic measures to combat climate change. Do the ministers agree that more time should be put to accurately assessing the baselines within our island so as to monitor progress in the future, rather than allowing a free-for-all of indiscriminate actions with the pointing of condescending figures at others? OK, Andrew, thank you for that question. I think the Environment Minister wants to come well, jump straight I, in. I, I, from where I sit, I don't recognise these condescending figures. There are choices well, that face the planet. There are, choices that fa there are choices that face the planet. And I think, as a society, we've got to find where we... How, where the, the priority decisions we make. The officers that I work with have given me a great deal of detail on what we know about our current baselines. There's no question. And as we progress through this, that baseline monitoring, which is also checked by external expert um, bodies, I forget the name of the body that we subscribe to who do that um, monitoring of our emissions, will give us regular updates. Now, the actions that have come out, I think probably um, Andrew is referring to perhaps the, um, the issues coming from the, um, from the Citizens' Assembly. Uh, we went to enormous lengths to see that that was as a, independent as it could be, an objective. And we went to the Sortition Foundation. We spent huge sums of, you know, big sums of money to make sure the selection of the people crossed right across the spectrum, including people that had a prior predisposition to carbon neutrality and those that didn't. And so that were, those were all brought together with a lot of... Uh, facts and information. I don't know whether Andrew was able to watch all those those sessions. I can't remember what the protocols were, but I think they're all available online, all on the website where all of that detail is there, and they've produced recommendations, which we are now at the stage where political judgments have to be made. And I think what we started to do is to tell, tell you about the processes. The processes are there will be some very important key strategic documents published before the end of the year. And I think those decisions then will allow, there will be decisions ahead. And personally, I think those decisions will um, take place or I, you know, round about the time that whether the, the states finishes its term. I don't know whether the states will prepare to do that or whether it will go on to the next assembly, I don't know. But that's the process. And I think the process is a good one, and all interests need to be heard. And so I think, Andrew, that there is bags of opportunity for specific issues in the long list, and I can't remember how many there were, of recommendations 
to 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 discuss those in great detail. I think it'd be better. My my assistant minister has done a lot of detailed work on this. If he wants to add to that, it might be helpful. But frankly, um, I think that we are in a process, and I think the things have changed. Several years ago, the debate was: Is there a climate problem? Now it's not. Now it is I believe there's universality. It is now sh common ground across the planet that there's an emergency that we have to take actions. Yes, ju just to add one thing, and you know, it's, it's probably the um, the problem that Andrew has. Um, there are, we have a few well-meaning environmentalists who are extremely active, and they are they are promoting some ways of uh, dealing with carbon neutrality or net zero uh, that may not be completely reasonable. Uh, so I'm very grateful to them because they have pushed the, the, um, the notion that uh, climate change was something really important, that it was happening. Uh, but uh, it is time to leave this to the scientists. There are ways to do this. Uh, going out and planting little trees everywhere actually may not be the, the right thing to do. Meadows may be better. There may be better ways to, to accommodate uh, uh, Jersey's wildlife. Uh, and also, and, and I can put this out uh, here now, it's quite important, the biodiversity crisis is actually the loss of, uh, of wildlife uh, accompanying the climate change crisis uh, is actually more severe. We can adapt to climate change. We can live with five degrees more. Uh, as, as the human race, we will easily do it. It won't be a problem. Uh, we will lose half of the animals on the planet. And that may actually be a worse issue to us than the actual climate change. So this is something that we have to look at in parallel. It is unbelievably complex. It is really not something that you can do by saying, oh, cows burp methane, so kill all cows, or stop eating meat, or stop drinking milk. Um, this is actually a very, very big misunderstanding uh, that we could explain if, we gave us, if somebody gave us the time. I to pick up this point about trees. I remember in the early session he spoke as an example of the these, these situation that he's referring to, I think, planting trees everywhere. Today in our conference between other island communities, we identified and identified strongly the, the fact that we have got limited opportunity for carbon sequestration in our finite land area and with our agricultural activities and all of the other things that we try and squeeze out of our scarce area land. But the really significant thing for me is the work recently done with the marine scientists, with universities and Blue Marine, have all shown that the existing amount of carbon sequestration that's going on in our marine ecosystems in our seas exceeds by a country mile the emissions from our business sector. So blue carbon, as it's proposed, is a hugely important matter that the reports that I'm talking about will refer to that. It requires science and requires investment. But I think there are, you know, that's an example, I think, of the complications that um, Gregory spoke of. OK, thank you very much. Um, Andrew, I hope that's answered some of your questions. I'm afraid we are going to move on. I have watching you nodding through some of that at least. Um, we're going on to fishing now and seeing as the French fishermen seem to be winning every battle against Jersey, is it fair to say that Jersey fishermen have been hung out to dry? Well, if I can start and then Gregory, who in fact <laughs> went to Paris with uh, Senator Gorse, may wish to come in. Um, look, we didn't... We, we, in the run-up to Brexit, we put forward our view that we wanted to see improvements to the Bay of Granville Agreement. Our fishermen knew what that were. That would mean the reduced fishing effort in our waters, which were, is known and is still known to be unsustainable. Our fish stocks are declining. And we have been taking too much out of our waters historically. We wanted to see better regulation, which under the Granville Bay was done jointly with the French. Now, at four days' notice, that agreement was changed and it comes on to our sole responsibility, which is an open secret that our neighbours and friends in France, really, it's not what they wanted to see. We didn't ask for it. But I, we, what we've had to do is make a choice whether we went into the agreement, which wasn't just about fishing. Fishing was the mind a bit. The whole thing was about trade and about international communications and, and financial affairs and all that sort of thing. We had to make that choice. And the case was overwhelming that we should go in. 
Now what we've had is, to, I think, initially teething troubles. We've stuck to the agreement. We've tried to solve those problems. I do understand the concerns of the fishermen, but we've made quite plain to the French that when we get through this licensing issue, we will need to have conservation measures based on the science. And the states have invested very substantial of money on marine science to assess our stocks um, the take that we got, and, and therefore I think all that is being shared and has put us in good stead. I hope we overcome the immediate issue. Senator Gorse is doing his best, very, very best, to, to get those relationships working as well. And Gregory, I think, if he can add to that. Yeah, we're going to see some blue water soon. Yes, I've, I've got a couple of things. The, um, uh, we saw the, um, the trade cooperation agreement a few days before we had to sign it. And I must say, uh, that for fishing, um, it, was, it was not what we expected, uh, but it was a relief because basically what it said is that it is going to be a complete statu quo on the effort and Jersey will get the management of its own waters, which it didn't have before. Now, managing our own waters is something pretty serious, pretty important in terms of sovereignty and something that we, we absolutely, absolutely desperately wanted and that we didn't have in the Bay of Granville Agreement. Having the same effort was a good starting point for, once you have the management, becoming better and more sustainable. So <clears throat> we, ex we had to accept it. It was not bad. It was, it was good. And frankly, for the French, it should have been acceptable as well because we were keeping the same effort. What they fished in 2019, they could fish in 2020 or 2021. So. You know, we, we went into it uh, very honestly, thinking we'll do exactly, it will be exactly the same. The same boats that were here last year will be here this year, no problem at all. And it uh, didn't go exactly as planned. Um, of course, one of the biggest problems is that we didn't sign this. The UK signed it on our behalf with the EU. So the French are not directly involved and we are not directly involved. And of course, the, having to go back and forth probably was part of, uh, a big part of the problem. Uh, I think we're, again, we're getting near completion, but we never wavered from the principle that the effort cannot increase. What was fished in 2019 is what's going to be fished in 2021 or 2022 when all this is done. Okay. Um, we've got less than five, well, almost less than three minutes to go. One more question, I'm afraid, from um, our viewers. And I must apologise to two of our, or half our panel, who've not had a word in edgeways on this so far, but perhaps we'll hear a bit in the moment. Um, what chance do we realistically have of getting Jersey to carbon neutrality by 2030? Is this commitment just a load of hot air? You're looking at me, Senator. Do you, no, want, no, to, do you want to I'm, jump I'm, in? No, I, I mean, I, I, I'm, I'm going to be absolutely honest. I, I, I don't think we have a chance of getting to carbon neutrality by 2030, but it's certainly the right goal to aim for. I'd rather set a goal of 2030 and achieve it by 2040 than set a goal of 2050 and wait till 2050 till we achieve it. But we will do everything we, we, we can to, to reach our aims in a realistic time scale. But I think, being honest, I think 2030 is pushing it. I'll, I'll, I'll I can get, sorry, I can drop in here. Uh, uh, there's, there's a very important point, and I'm pretty sad that it's something that we didn't ask when we did the uh, Citizens' Assembly. We didn't ask that question, and it's a very important question. How much money, how much effort are you personally ready to make for carbon neutrality? Now, we're going to bring in some very various figures when we talk about the roadmap for carbon neutrality. It takes a lot of money to do all these conversions, convert uh, uh, heaters, change cars, uh, you know, change planes. All of these cost a lot of money. It's a very big sum put together, but what it is actually is 1% of our gross domestic product, or if you turn it into you know, normal people, 1% of your budget. So if everybody in this island is ready to dedicate 1% of their budget to carbon neutrality, <coughs> we can actually achieve it. So yes, it's immense figures, but not if everybody participates. Okay, I know Deputy Young, you probably want to be, you could hold the room for till midnight on, on this subject, but we're, we are almost out of time from each of you, and we'll, we'll end with um, Senator Farnham. Um, specifically on the environment, what do you want from the government plan? Well, first of all, carbon neutral, and it has to be. I've, I've attended young, pe young people's parliaments 
the, the Assembly, the Youth Assembly and the Parliament, our young people are absolutely get it. And we've got a duty to future generations. This is future. So, yes, there are reluctance, but I think um, states members need to, need to back that plan when it comes. Yes, get the details right, but back it and set the journey. Car, on the question of the island plan, I think that's really important. I don't want to go over the details. Uh, that we really need that island plan to set the future of how we look after our coast and countryside, how we achieve our housing, and we do all the things we need in the next few years. It's desperately important. And on the things of the environment side, we've spoken of trees, dealing with pollution, and we've also got the issue of tightening up on regulation, where there's a whole agenda of work, which I think probably my successor will need to pick up, I'm afraid. I'm afraid we are bang out of time. Um, Senator Farnham, you've got 10 seconds. Just quickly to sum up, the government planned four-year finan financial plan it is, is that there to ensure effective, efficient and sustainable management of our public funds. It's there to deliver positive, positive sustainable economic outcomes and most of all it's there to ensure the provision of modern and highly valued public services. Okay, that was more than 10 seconds. Thank you very much indeed to our panel. I'm sorry Deputy Martin we didn't get to you on this section. Our next Ask the Ministers on the 24th of November with the Jersey Youth Parliament. Thank you very much for joining us this evening.